Good afternoon to everyone. Uh, we are going to try and uh, begin this discussion on time. It's the uh, third uh, roundtable organized by the SHIFT uh, project on decarbonizing the economy. And we're going to uh, speak about the way of uh, decarbonizing the European construction sector. Uh, I'm going to give you uh, numbers uh, for France, uh, which can be extrapolated to Europe. Uh, construction accounts for half of the uh, energy consumed, uh, one quarter of the greenhouse gas emissions, about one quarter of the uh, consumption in fossil fuel of our country. And when the and the cost it accounts for is about uh, 15 to 20 billion uh, euros of imports of fossil fuel per year. It's a sector where there are a number of significant initiatives which have uh, begun. It's uh, a fairly consensual sector because people know more or less what to do. And to discuss this afternoon, it's our great pleasure to welcome uh, three major players uh, in the sector. I will be mentioning uh, them in the order in which they will speak. First of all, Philippe Pelletier, a lawyer uh, by profession, uh, president of the uh, Sustainable Building Plan. Then we will hear Martin Bouygues, uh, who is uh, head of the Bouygues Group. And we will hear uh, Jens uh, Bergensen, the uh, recently appointed uh, CEO of Rockwood International which uh, produces insulating material uh, from rock wool. It has uh, one large plant in France, at least, uh, and he will be closing the discussion. So uh, each uh, of the speakers will uh, hear a few questions and will provide answers uh, uh, which I'm not informed of in advance, and then there will be a, a few questions from the participants, and that will take us to half past three. Without further ado, we'll begin with the questions to Philippe Pelletier, and I will uh, go and uh, sit with the participants, the speakers. The first question uh, to Philippe Pelletier is simple. We've been hearing over and over and over again that uh, construction is a challenge, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Looking at the uh, numbers uh, in our uh, country, uh, it may be of the same order of magnitude uh, in other European countries. And the numbers are not yet high. Some people would like things to speed up a bit. From what, your point of view, could you tell us why there is this gap between the will of a certain number of people to engage in action and this, the pace at which uh, things are being done? Well, I was raised with uh, one rule, which is uh, go slowly, we're in a hurry. And uh, I think that this uh, applies fairly well to our topic here. I don't have the same vision as uh, you do of uh, the slowness uh, of the uh, process underway. And uh, in uh, the construction sector, a number of essential things have happened. Uh, first of all, uh, the parameter, which is the energy consumption, which was outside of our reflection and our behavior uh, be it that of professionals uh, or the users, uh, that is now taken into consideration. And we've also all understood, and some of us have uh, begun engaging in action and others not yet, but people have understood how important it is for the uh, households and uh, the economy of the country and for the environment, which has to be controlled. It is important to save energy and try and produce energy tomorrow. So my feeling is that uh, uh, the movement has begun. And my second comment is that it was accompanied uh, by uh, a good uh, public decision. Uh, the uh, 
main uh, stakeholders in the country were brought together uh, to see uh, what they could do. And then Jean-Louis Borloo was able uh, to get uh, the national elected representatives uh, to adopt the project and project uh, all the way to uh, 2050. And in July, Ségolène Royal uh, continued the movement with the text which was adopted in July this year. And she indicated that for the construction sector, uh, she was following the line of what had been started by Jean-Louis Borloo. So there is continuity in uh, the public authorities' action, which enables investors and households uh, and service providing companies uh, to be part of this movement. A third and last comment. All you need to do is uh, walk around uh, the show area. If you look at uh, what is being done by uh, building uh, companies on new buildings, we are building uh, new uh, buildings which uh, consume less energy and uh, we are producing low carbon uh, buildings. Uh, and it is no secret that uh, the WE group uh, is uh, uh, very advanced uh, in this area. Uh, uh, WIG uh, is already working on the next step, which is positive energy uh, buildings. And so there is a general trend which is uh, seen. What is lacking? What is lacking is the extension of all of these actions to the whole of the territory. This will take time because it's not natural for each of us to refurbish one's uh, home. Companies uh, which rent offices uh, or own uh, offices uh, are busy with other concerns uh, rather than refurbishing uh, their stock uh, of offices. And uh, so uh, the active forces uh, are not yet uh, operational. There are several ways of encouraging uh, present owners of uh, buildings, uh, housing, or uh, other buildings. Uh, there are different ways of encouraging them uh, to engage in action uh, through uh, regulation, through an increase in the cost of energy, through taxation, or you can decide to quietly wait for a shortage to uh, solve the problem, and that will lead to price increases, but not necessarily, and the problem will solve itself. From your point of view, what are the advantages and disadvantages of all three uh, options, uh, and uh, do you have a view that uh, you can express? I have uh, views uh, on forcing or letting people decide. I have uh, views on uh, the possible evolution of the price of the barrel in the future. Uh, this is no secret, but the whole model uh, of the French energy plan had been based on the price of the barrel, which wasn't uh, uh, around 40 or $45, which is the current level. We understand the short-term uh, advantages uh, that this uh, cheap access to fossil energy provides. We also understand the disadvantages that uh, this uh, leads to. But I'm not an expert, and uh, I'll be content with uh, discussing uh, incentive uh, or uh, disincentive. As uh, president of the Plan Bâtiment Durable, uh, my job is to uh, co collect, or to be informed of the uh, state of mind of uh, the various stakeholders. And uh, in the energy transition law, I think we've reached uh, a good equilibrium. It is translated into three things. First of all, today, clearly, uh, we are still waiting for a 
uh, support on the part of society without uh, constraints, without forcing the public to do a number of things. There are formal obligations, but there is no immediate obligation to engage in action. Secondly, uh, there may be um, constraints in the future. Uh, is that good or bad? Well, uh, I'll, I'll explain first and give you my conclusion later on. So the first thing is we're still seeking the support of society. And I believe that support from society is important, is necessary. From a cultural point of view, it is uh, difficult to uh, decide to refurbish one's uh, home or office. It's not self-evident. It takes time to change one's behavior and uh, take the decision to do something. Now, uh, 10 to 15 years from now, uh, we're saying that there will be uh, an obligation. So I find it an interesting approach. After a phase of uh, creating awareness or uh, encouraging people, we may need to take strong measures, tough measures. And then thirdly, there's one thing that we've looked at, which uh, the parliament adopted in the energy transition law, which is obligations that don't appear to be obligations. And I'll give you two examples. First of all, and you will see that we're going, and it's a matter of uh, common sense. You, you tell uh, people who uh, rent spaces that um, if you uh, don't uh, refurbish your uh, premises, there will come a time where you will no longer be able to rent these premises. It's a way of encouraging people to refurbish. And we also say, if you are going to refurbish, take into consideration environmental efficiency. If you're going to redo the roofing, well, insulate the roofing. If you're going to do refurbishing work, do it right, do it well. And the measure is uh, accompanied with great cautiousness. And uh, this is something where we innovated, and this was adopted by the parliament. This obligation to take into consideration uh, environmental efficiency in, in refurbishing work uh, is acceptable only if it is uh, acceptable from a financial point of view. If uh, there is no return on investment, if there uh, is no architectural constraint which it provides, uh, which uh, prevents you from uh, insulating from the outside of the building or you will be encroaching on the neighbor's plot. So performance has to be taken into consideration where work is done. So we're still seeking support. We will, we are indicating that it's not going to last forever in the form of an incentive it will become compulsory, and we begin injecting uh, a, a certain amount of quality in the uh, renovation work underway. A tricky question. If you want to reach factor four, which is uh, what is proposed in the uh, European uh, society, um, bankers are good at calculations. Do you think that the measures in the transition law are uh, in line with the objective to reduce uh, by 3% the consumption of fossil fuels by existing buildings? The answer is no if you wish to have a linear downward slope, as you indicated. But uh, the answer is yes if you consider that there will be a speeding up of the trend. That is what I wanted you uh, to hear you say. Uh, you need to continue uh, pressing on the accelerator. One last question. There is a possible difference between uh, the theoretical performance and what you achieve in real life. The economic e equation doesn't depend on what is announced at the outset. It depends on what you actually get in the end. So uh, 
do you have ways of improving the certainty seen from the owner of the building that the numbers announced uh, will be achieved? It's the whole matter of training of people, etc. Well, two words, uh, training and guarantee. As far as, as training is concerned, we haven't reached the end of the road. We launched something which was rather wild, so to speak. We say to uh, people, uh, craftsmen who uh, did work, which was subsidized by the state, if you do not uh, uh, provide evidence that uh, you are uh, certified as having had training, uh, you will no longer be able to do the subsidized work. So we're raising the bar so that uh, uh, training can be speeded up. And it will become difficult for someone who doesn't have the certification to uh, get the contract for work which is subsidized uh, by the state. Obviously, uh, households uh, want to uh, benefit from the subsidies. Now, the uh, second word is guarantee. The more society engages in the transformation of existing buildings, the more it will uh, need to obtain results, or they want to be sold results. Bouygues Immobilier and uh, other developers, uh, he must ha have uh, Bouygues shares because it's the fifth time that he's mentioned the name Bouygues. Uh, no, I don't, but uh, I see front runners uh, and uh, um, there are people uh, who run ahead of the train, and uh, Buig is uh, one of them. So, um, what is being sold is a performance, and it changes uh, the uh, job of developers. Rather than disappearing once the building is built, uh, they are forced to uh, still be present uh, during the operation, during the life of the building. It's often uh, the Formula One car that experiments uh, solutions. And uh, I believe that this will progressively be extended uh, to the existing stock of uh, buildings. Some uh, buildings, uh, rather than buying specific work to be done, uh, they're uh, buying a result, the energy performance contract. And uh, this provides uh, confidence uh, because uh, if the result isn't there, uh, the uh, company will have to pay for the difference. I believe that progressively we will be moving towards a strengthening of or reinforcement of a request for uh, guarantees, for assurances. And uh, since uh, uh, companies uh, are monitoring what their clients want, I think that will be developed. How can that be ensured? That remains to be determined. There are large companies which are able to do that because they can insure themselves for those uh, engagements. Uh, those commitments. But one will have to uh, ensure that uh, uh, constructors, uh, craftsmen, are able to insure themselves. And it's not obvious. And here also, it takes time, and uh, we shouldn't rush too much. But we're going to change uh, speakers now. Martin Bouygues, we're delighted to have you here. Uh, you don't speak in public very often, so we're particularly honored that you uh, are here following our invitation. Uh, your activity is at the heart of the question I'm going to be asking. Um, construction companies are mainly, mainly present uh, in the area of new construction. One of the major challenges is transforming the existing stock of buildings. Uh, what does it mean for a group such as yours in your activity? Does it need to change or not? And as Philippe uh, Feltier said, uh, where do you need to uh, move uh, forward slowly because we're in a hurry? 
Well, there are several parts to your question. The first thing is that uh, for a long time already, uh, we have been involved in refurbishing. It's one of the specialty activities uh, of Buig for Buig uh, real estate and Buig uh, construction. The motivation uh, for these refurbishing activities, for the most part, was uh, economic savings. Owners of uh, real estate had an economic motivation to refurbish uh, the buildings they own to uh, draw more advantage from them. Now, the motivation has now to shift. Uh, there should be uh, another motivation apart from the economic uh, money motivation. Uh, obviously, there should be incentive, be it uh, by virtue of the law, compulsory or financial incentives. And the other thing is the interest of individuals, which is becoming stronger and stronger, uh, their interest in living in an environment in which they recognize themselves. Uh, people have an aspiration to have uh, to live in, in an environment where they will have a lesser impact on the environment and hope to leave uh, their successors uh, in a situation which will be better. Uh, it's a journey people are making. And um, what has struck me uh, during the past 10 years is that during the period, mentalities have changed considerably. And this uh, makes me fairly optimistic. And uh, I think that we have a future that lies ahead of us. Ten years ago, the uh, level of knowledge was much lower. The uh, amount of solutions proposed was much lower. There were few people uh, in our staff that had the uh, necessary uh, technological competencies. So we've made a lot of progress uh, in a 10-year period, and a lot of project uh, pr progress remains to be achieved. Now, in countries such as France, uh, there is obviously a huge uh, stock of buildings uh, that need to be refurbished. It means either res restoring or renovating uh, the uh, buildings that exist or recycling the existing uh, material uh, and try to have as uh, low an impact as possible from the point of view of carbon. Or the third possibility is making available homes or buildings or collective equipment uh, that will have uh, the lowest possible impact on the environment. We started looking into that 10 years ago, and uh, when I uh, tried to create an awareness in the people who work for us. I considered that uh, the problem should be asked in a simple way. Let us not take sustainable development as a constraint. Let us see it as an opportunity. And I seriously believe that it is a real opportunity uh, for the old economy, uh, for uh, Europe, for the United States, for Japan. It means real savings because th there are considerable uh, investments uh, to be made uh, to have uh, as low an impact as possible. We're talking about two degrees. Uh, we know it's going to be difficult, but it is uh, already a large number. So we know that uh, major efforts will have to be made. And uh, what makes me optimistic uh, is the uh, total change in mentalities, and I think that this is a very favorable point. If I understand correctly what you're saying, if the market is there, uh, ch changing our business activity doesn't matter. Yes, on the contrary, uh, that's what we're here for. Uh, we have our uh, headquarters, uh, Challenger, which was a 25-year-old building. And in order to train specialists and to demonstrate to our clients and to everyone that it is feasible, let us do it while the building is occupied. And uh, Challenger uh, had a normal performance uh, considering the date at which it was built. 
and we've uh, been able to refurbish the building while it was in operation. So uh, it was a complicated operation, but it was uh, an experience for everyone. That's how it should be approached. Uh, asked Philippe Pelletier uh, what he thought of the French context. You're an international group, and uh, uh, the French love to think that they're better than uh, the others. Uh, but uh, do you think there's a, another country which would set a good example that France should be following? Well, uh, what I'm pleased is to see that all countries feel concerned to varying degrees. But uh, all know that there is a problem. Uh, this was not the case uh, 10 years ago. I'm just back from Cuba, and uh, the economy is developing. Uh, and that is one of the topics on the table, and that's a good thing. The countries which have adopted a very positive approach are, as usual, Northern European countries and Switzerland, where Buig is very present and where we carry out a lot of operations uh, with uh, an interesting performance. In Germany also, which has made a lot of progress on all of these topics. and. Uh, I think that uh, the governments should uh, show a bit of continuity in their efforts. For instance, uh, electricity uh, bought from uh, solar production uh, in the French rural areas. At one point, you must make a choice, and you must uh, accept the responsibility of the choice you've made, and you should make an effort. And that will uh, have a determining effect uh, on the results obtained. You cannot afford to change your policy constantly because that will make things unmanageable. Precisely about that as part of the really essential aspects on your core business in construction, what are the policy items which are unstable, you think, and that are worth stabilizing? Well, when you have PV facilities where you sell the power to the uh, national uh, operator, the price differences are, of course, fundamental in the speed of deployment of such equipment. That's just one item amongst others. Then you need an incentive policy through standards, uh, of course. And you also need to explain to a lot of homeowners or tenants, be they um, residential buildings or office buildings, you should tell them that they have an advantage in using high-performance offices or high-performance housing units. They'll have a benefit in the mid to long term, in economic terms, but also a reputational benefit for their own people, their own employees or tenants. I saw at Buick that the operations that we did are part and parcel of the mindset in the company. And I can see that in France, there's a huge stock of office buildings that uh, is uh, now obsolete. And I think that the tenants or owners forget that through a refurbishment operation, maybe they could do a good financial deal. And anyway, that uh, would be very good to energize their company. And that uh, would be uh, an actual effect. Regarding office space with Philippe Pelletier, we worked on that a few months ago, we worked on a system that was there to strengthen refurbishment in uh, public office space, which is not really an issue in France, because these are uh, buildings that are very often slightly old. You have uh, big surfaces, big surface areas that are significant or that may be, and we think that for large companies like yours, this is the type of operation that may be interesting. So why do you think this is not really uh, increasing mushrooming all over the place. Well, there's a problem with financial uh, public finances for the moment. Uh, and uh, it's not organized the same way as the private sector. And uh, it's not just a French issue. It's uh, the same in a lot of other countries. And there's a problem with uh, leading by example in France. If you go to the presidential palace and you can see the condition, if you go to the prime minister's office, it's really archaic, the places they are, they are occupying. And I think that the image that uh, France is projecting is not very positive. And in terms of performance, that's really below par. 
it is true that in terms of uh, being exemplary, you could do better. Of course, there's been a lot of refurbishment. That was a joke, really, but there's been a lot of refurbishment through high schools, middle schools, hospitals. A lot has been done, but there's still a lot left to be done. And uh, it's true that the government doesn't necessarily have the same motivation as the private sector for refurbishment. Uh, financial incentives are not the main motivation for the government. What drives the government is to provide civil servants with high performance, high quality premises to work in and also project a more modern and more efficient image regarding public policy. If you forced uh, public housing managers to think in uh, total cost terms, forcing them to think in terms of total costs, you think that this would trigger more operations or are things more complicated? It depends on who's keeping the accounts, says Martin Bouy. It needs to be fairly objective in this matter, but yes, of course, we all know of a lot of public buildings that are not too up to standards. Only disabled access standards or health standards, they haven't, they haven't kept up with the times. So the government imposes more on the private sector than it imposes on itself. It's driven by uh, good intentions, but uh, maybe it could uh, really practice what it preaches. And if you look at the city around the buildings, uh, Bouygues started taking positions on the uh, next level, developing districts, and that way we are looking at flows between buildings. In this area, is there something that we can say publicly about your strategy and the underlying fundamentals? Why do you think that it's important for a company like yours to go to that level? Well, we're not thinking uh, about isolated buildings. We're thinking about buildings in the city. We consider that you need to look at, this, at life in the city. So it's all about urban planning, big word. It's a complex science. There are a lot of uh, big planners and architects working a lot on that. Urban planning is the art of living in the city. It's something complex that's not set and frozen in time. What we've done between Colas, Bouygues Immobilier, and uh, Bouygues Construction, and even maybe Alstom, and also Bouygues Telecom in some areas, is that we've looked at the energy and informational flows that there may be within a district, a neighborhood. And we wondered how we could organize it all through transport, energy consumption, uh, a host of different fields. To take one example, Bouygues Immobilier, a few weeks ago, they opened a concept that seems exceptionally innovative that's called Nextdoor. Nextdoor is for office buildings what uh, the hospitality sector is to uh, traveling people. It's a possibility to uh, receive people who need offices in a model that's very cooperative, participatory, and very flexible, too. This type of operation does contribute to saving on operating costs and environmental impact, and I think that this is going in the right direction. It's just one example. There will be a lot more to think about. But I think that this is an approach that we also wanted to develop at the level of Bouygues. We wanted to develop internal communication tools to exchange information and knowledge about this specific world of sustainable development. When 10 years ago we started the movement, we realized that it was difficult to do that because we would hire more or less young people who had uh, studied in specific areas and there were few people who were trained in sustainable development and it was difficult for them to be hired at all levels of the company. That's why we decided to set up tools through intranets for information and knowledge sharing in order to facilitate flows and to facilitate the cross-cutting flow of information within large corporations. It's always difficult in big firms like ours because there tend to be silos and it's very compartmentalized. Uh, and that's what we needed to change in the way we worked to be more efficient. 
so the final word is to decarbonize, you need to uh, take a cross-cutting approach? Yes, quite clearly. Uh, now let's uh, move on to Jens. Jens, right? Uh, Jens Bergensen, uh, you're a CEO of a company making insulation material. It's international in an international session. I'll ask the questions in, in French. Jens will answer in English, so everyone will have uh, their share of uh, linguistic diversity. Uh, rock wool, as the name says, you make insulation material with rock wool. Uh, as seen from uh, the shareholders' standpoint, it seems that rock wool is in a very good position to benefit from this desire to decarbonize buildings. From your perspective, the things that make your company uh, better in uh, uh, an environment that's decarbonized, what are these items? What are these strengths? Is it just re let's reduce fossil fuel consumption and things will happen on their own? Or do you need a framework that will be need to be a bit more precise? Could you share with us the favorable aspects or what would be not so favorable to you? I'm not quite sure I got the same question here as yourself, <laughs> but uh, uh, just before I Actually, start. I, I, I can repeat the question in English if you want. Uh, yeah, yeah, maybe yeah. do that. Then. So what I said is that seen from Mars, uh, you run a company that seems to be in a good position to ah. benefit from an obligation to phase out fossil fuels from the building sector. Uh, is it as simple as putting a constraint on fossil fuels, or you need drivers uh, that are more complex than that? And then can you say what is favorable to your activity and what is uh, making life harder for a company like yours? Yeah. So let's um, first start with some major drivers. And you, you might wonder why, why a company like Rockwell making insulation is here with such famous companies as your company. Um, yes. Can you hear me there? And, and, and the reason is that uh, in society today, one would think that maybe transportation is the biggest uh, energy consumer. It's not, it's buildings. 40% of all energy is consumed by buildings. Um, and there is not a lot of new build being done. And we have heard in the case for restoration. And in that context, when you come to insulation, uh, just a company like ours, we make insulation one year's production from us in insulation. Could, could you put yeah. up the mic? Yeah, because there just, is some noise around. Yeah, and just one, one year's production of our insulation is enough to save, uh, when you install that and you do the life cycle calculation, it's enough to save the whole uh, CO2 uh, emission from the whole US economy one year. Or another way of expressing it, the all airline flights on Earth the whole CO2 emissions for seven years. So insulation in the context of buildings and restoration is a big, big thing that we need to address. Um, that's a driver. A second driver I would like to mention is that we all in this room are spending 70 to 90% of our time in building, in a building, indoors, and that trend is rather increasing. Um, and that makes it even more important for us to improve indoor climate and improve the energy efficiency of building and make sure that the buildings we have are really taken care of. Those are the main drivers, I would say. Do, do you need a, a clear signal on the price of energy or it's not the main thing you need uh, in order to boost your sales to be trivial? I, I think... Um, being a private house owner myself, just having one house, there is a payback issue when you have a house you live in. And that is that when you go after and apply technologies that exist today that reduce the energy consumption of a building with 70, 80%, that's possible without particularly sophisticated technologies. You insulate the house and you renovate it. That sounds simple, but when you look at the payback, we're talking eight, nine, 10, 11 years plus that it's uh, quite difficult to do. And that means that as a collective, we all see that that's good and that we should save that 40% energy and use it for something better. 
but as individuals, it's very easy to find that decision hard to make. So what we do is that we postpone it. And therefore, I think it's very important that people like you and us and the construction industry work together to try to promote that there is a framework so that people get financial support and regulation to make these decisions so that we get going with an increased rate of renovation. Regarding the, I mentioned the price, uh, but actually you have other possibilities uh, to increase the, the, the pace at which renovations take place. Do you have an opinion on uh, whether we should enhance uh, the level of regulation, uh, drive up the price, or just wait? <laughs> it's exactly the question yeah. that I asked Philippe Pelletier, but yeah. you are, as uh, Martin Bouygues, uh, the CEO of a group uh, which is present worldwide. So do you have an opinion derived from your own experience or yeah. your company's experience yeah. on what, what is the good thing to do? Yeah. For, first of all, I'm, a, I'm not a good waiter. So <laughs> uh, I, I don't promote that alternative. And I think the energy pricing, with all the political impacts of that, um, th that can go up and that can go down. It was not many years ago we all talked about oil at 140 and 150, and now we see something else. So I think that these things can go up and down, but there is a fundamental climate concern and it's a fundamental macro trend and uh, that, that gives us as leaders of companies the obligation to drive that this renovation and modernization happen. But in a shorter perspective, if I were to put one factor on the table that I think can encourage people to act now, uh, the politicians to put in more regulation and promote this and also industry to support it. That is that um, all of these activities that we are talking about, they create jobs and uh, they drive economic development and it's a good investment in infrastructure that always is healthy for an economy. So I think that just the economic factor of creating jobs while we improve the planet are quite appealing to me. And you think we should have uh, more stringent regulations to promote that, or? Yes. Yes, okay. <laughs> straightforward answer to a straightforward question. Uh, as you probably know, seen from the building owner, uh, when you renovate, you buy some kind of a performance, and that performance doesn't only depend on the, the fact that you manufacture good products. What is the influence that you can have on the fact that your good products, because I assume that they are good, uh, will, be, will lead uh, to full operations once they are in place that are uh, compliant with the level of performance that the owner expects. Yeah. I, I think we see in our society the impact of digitalization. We all live with it every day. And um, there is a very good trend in, in the building industry today to try to integrate through building information modeling with software across uh, the different uh, building materials that are supplied. I think that's very important because it's an industry where I'm an insulation person and someone else might be uh, producing uh, plasterboards, etc. And it all needs to work together as a system because if there are gaps between, the overall solution doesn't work. So I think that application of software, uh, building information modeling is key. The second layer, I, I think, is um, the fundamentals of that companies like, uh, like ours, uh, that we make products that are easy to install and that they last a very long time. It's no good in, in the European environment to create products that might last 10 or 12 years. We need to think 35, 40 years so that it really sits well once it's installed and that it's easy to install. Uh, and then finally, uh, it comes back to how you manage your products and how you train the people installing the material because when you are want to squeeze out the last bit of um, performance from uh, more and more modern building materials, you need to install it in a good way. And that, that comes with the construction companies and also from our side to, to support uh, high quality workmanship. 
And uh, again, uh, as you operate in a number of countries, do you see differences in the way to train uh, the people that will install your products uh, in the various countries in which you operate? And are there things that are particularly interesting to notice in this field? Yeah, I mean, you have normal differences in, in skills uh, of the artisans and the people uh, that install something. But I think the number one observation I made is, uh, made is that the construction industry is, is conservative. A uh, particular region tend to build a particular type of house. And uh, uh, I've seen everywhere you go that if you change from the local standard, and you need to do something different, it's very easy that you go wrong because people are not keen on sitting and reading up. They install according to tradition. So that means that whenever you shift a way of building, you need to invest tremendously in training and supervision or it will, in most cases, go wrong. Okay. Is there something particularly emblematic uh, in the achievements of your company that you say this is something to put in front whenever I'm asked a question yeah. <laughs> of what should yeah. we do? So, so I, I have that slogan I already said, 5 billion tons of carbon dioxide is saved with our products. One year's production saved 5 billion and that's the size of the US economy. I think that really motivates everyone working with insulation, even though insulation may sound boring. The other aspect that I think is emblemic is that um, in Europe, there are anywhere between 10 and 11 percent of the population that live in fuel poverty. And I was to a project in the UK in Portsmouth where you had a big building with almost 300 families and they can't afford to heat their house because it's totally uninsulated. And the most um, kind of um, the aspect that hurt the most, I mean, we're going to insulate that, uh, is uh, the children that can't get the education because when you can't heat the house, you can't, uh, you can't study, and it, it drives all sorts of negative effects. So simple things like insulation, and a decent indoor climate still in a rich region like Europe today is not solved anywhere. And that, and that for me was important to see. Finally, I, I think there is also an issue about fire and sound. You have anywhere up to 1% of GDP in Europe consumed in different fires and poor quality work. Uh, I, I think fire and sound as an issue that we make safe buildings is, is something that is really important that is close to our product and what we do. Uh, the last question is a little bit more personal, I should say. Uh, Rockwool is one of the members of the SHIP project. Uh, came in, what, two to three years ago. Uh, the question is, uh, you are, I understand, uh, pretty recent uh, in your company, but still, do you think it is uh, money well employed or money lost <laughs> uh, to give it to people like us uh, trying to motivate the economy uh, to move to a lower carbon, I would say, uh, level. Yeah. Um, I, I mean, I would like to thank you for, for driving the shift project. And uh, the reason I do that, that the mathematics behind that 40% of the energy is consumed or wasted in buildings, that's a number that needs to get out there and that needs to get solved. And I think you're particularly good in this country in terms of engineers to think through the whole system. And if you and the shift organization can put that on the table and we realize that is the number one thing we need to do, and it needs to happen in the installed base through restoration because the new build rate is less than 1% in most countries, uh, that you promote that is just an honor for us to be part of that with our little corner because we, we do insulation and some other things and we are just a small player. We are important, but we can contribute to that and we are very happy to do it. Well, thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to remind uh, the audience that Rockwall is headquartered in Denmark and so we at Shift are very happy 
to have uh, as our members, as one of our members, a company headquartered in Denmark. Martin Bouygues, would you like to comment on what the other two panelists said? I can see that Philippe Pelletier is full of praise about you. Is he right? Is he wrong? Or is it because uh, uh, his ideas are so good? Would you like to give him a few tips? Well, first of all, I'm very happy that uh, uh, people recognize the fact that we tried to make uh, efforts in this area, whereas the incentives were not real. Uh, you've been taking a look at what we've been doing for quite a while, Jean-Marc, so you know what I'm talking about. I don't really believe in a comprehensive, easy-to-find solution. I think that there will be thousands of things that will come together and that we need to find people facilitating this coming together good conditions, good circumstances, regulation, of course, we don't really like that, but of course that will be part of the solution. Insulation, of course, is quite essential. The figures speak for themselves. One year of uh, Rockwell's output is uh, a lot of uh, emissions saved. That's uh, wonderful, but still, I think that we need to keep the pressure, and we need to keep the pressure everywhere. Everyone needs to become aware that we're all a little responsible for what we're doing. That can be through the rise of electric vehicles, a lot of things in a lot of areas, but I think that gradually things will come together. You haven't answered the question. Do you think that Philippe Petit is a great man, and do you agree with everything he said? Yes. Yes, honestly, his mission is a bit complicated because uh, in a mature country like France where we have uh, old heritage and the problem is that in people's collective minds, this m gets the idea that we build for eternity. And I can tell you that, uh, thank God for us, uh, construction company, it's not true. But this uh, instills this false idea into people's minds that once we've built something, you shouldn't do anything about it. It's a total mistake. And so his mission is complicated because he needs to try and find ways to really start the movement, kickstart the system with a bit of constraints, but not too many, to get people gradually motivated. This is really the right approach, and we need to continue down that route without relenting in our efforts. What really strikes me is to see how far we've come in uh, 2015, but especially 10 years. And I think that in the next 10 years, this movement will be even bigger. This is exactly what Mr. Philippe Pelletier was explaining a moment ago. It's not at all a straight line. It's going to be uh, exponential. Philippe Pelletier. Would you like to add a comment? I'll add a question. Even if you're mostly looking at France, uh, sometimes you travel outside, don't you? And is there one country, what can we learn from the Scandinavians? I, I like Scandinavian. It's a good compromise between liberalism and uh, broad-based consensus. Do you think that there's something that we can learn from the Scandinavians, and if so, what? Well, before I uh, share with you my assessment, I'd like to take you to the Netherlands. There is one technique that's rising there, based on what, unst what understanding I have. That's a sort of contractual policy between companies and the government system. Green contracts, green deals that are signed between firms and the government. It's a sort of mobilization in which the company states what objectives it sets itself. It sets the objectives in the dialogue with the government, but it sets the goals itself, and it makes a commitment to stick to these goals. Environmental, energy, sustainable development goals, broadly speaking. And I think that this way forward, which uh, legal experts are calling soft law. I think that this is really the way forward. I no longer believe, and here, mm, this is part of the answer that I could uh, 
uh, ring to Mr. Biggerson. I don't at all believe in the effectiveness of imperative rules that uh, are imposed on a society that's uh, poorly prepared to apply these rules. It's very, it's always uh, satisfying to pass a law saying that you should do that, but very often people don't do that. This gives a negative image of public policy because you can see a sort of uh, uh, irresponsible power uh, putting laws out there without enforcing them. And I don't think that it's the right method to mobilize a society. I really believe in soft law approaches. And uh, sometimes we had some conversations about this issue, Jean-Marc. And I can uh, feel that uh, you, were, you had a more command and control approach than me. But it, maybe it's because you're more impatient than I am. But I don't at all believe that uh, it's because you let people do things on a voluntary basis that it's going to slow motivation down. I think that it's going to pay off. At our own little level in France, we've, inve we've invented voluntary commitment charters. I remember that even before the 2009 law, Jean-Louis Borloo asked uh, developers and builders to make commitments on the future anticipated rule. And uh, most developers, not all, but a large number of developers had made this commitment with the gradual ramp up. And since there were no government rules regarding the mobilization of the public and private office building stock to initiate refurbishment, I launched a voluntary commitment charter. And we have uh, about 100 signatories who are now at work now. And uh, regarding condominium boards, we also have a voluntary commitment charter through which we ask them to receive some training. They make commitments to get training and to also ask the issue of uh, energy refurbishment at the next general meeting of homeowners. 150 large firms have signed up so far. This is only the beginning, but such approaches create a momentum. Uh, they're in line with the current thinking in society, and they're based on the acceptability of constraints which is probably measured in a country where there are a lot of constraints. We know, for instance, that all of the constraints that there are in real estate. That was my observation, but I also have a question for Martin Bouygues. Yes, I understand when a large firm decides to really put itself at the right level in terms of expertise, effectiveness, and relevance. It can mobilize its resources. But there's a, a common and difficult issue be between us. One of the French peculiarities, which is that there are a lot of small SMEs, tradespeople, who are here to um, build our own cities and municipalities. So we need to maintain this economic fabric to embed these SMEs in this large market that's looming. But we also need to get them trained so that we can tackle this issue seriously. This is probably this is probably the single most difficult issue of the next few years. Generally speaking, for the whole territory, the quality in the service offering needs to be relevant when compared to uh, demand, which is going to be more and more demanding precisely. So this is a, an issue that we have in common but I don't know how we'll tackle it. Well, to answer your question, I think that companies like Rockwall, for instance, have an essential role to play. Because, of course, they have a role with all companies, large and small, in training people about installation methods. And I think that all industrial companies in the chain will need to make an extra effort in training contractors who are going to implement their materials. And on top of that, there will be the engineering firms that design projects. Also, uh, 
early on, and this is easier because you're dealing with engineers there, but early on we'll need to make a, a very big effort. What also makes me optimistic when I look at what's going on in the agri-food business with organic products, people now tell us that France is amongst the countries where organic is growing fastest. And I think that it's a good, it's positive because now there's collective awareness of all these issues. And because of this collective awareness, people are really now taking matters into their own hands, making a financial effort to really follow the organic approach. And so I think that here there's really something interesting to do. And there's a parallel between the two with one limitation in housing. In housing, there's a lot of um, rentals in France. And so you need to talk to both tenants and landlords. I'd like to remind you of uh, Philippe Pelletier's question, which was, what about uh, small companies? Well, people need to be trained, and uh, industrialists who uh, produce the elements are uh, major stakeholders in the training of uh, small businesses. Heard from the other panelists. Um, yeah, I, I agree very much to this aspect of the training, and I mentioned it before. Proper installation and training, especially, will make a change. 100% agreement. In terms of uh, uh, I was asked the question, do I believe in more regulation? Uh, I, I personally don't like to be regulated, but I think there is minimal levels that you need to raise the threshold, and then due to this uh, payback calculation that has a little bit too long payback, and also this aspect between landlords uh, and the length of their investment for the current tenants, there, there is a difference between how you invest, if you invest for yourself and you invest for a tenant in what type of material you use. I think there is an incentive model or a nurturing that is needed there to get it right, to get the investment then that for a society in long term sustainability uh, effect is the best. And, and that's a very difficult equation to balance. And we never find a solution to it, but I think there is an area where it Certainly, if we work together, we can make it much better quite quickly if we get the critical mass. Yeah. Philippe Pelletier is, a, is the president of a body. No, 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 no. The question is for Jean. Uh, is the president of a French body, uh, which uh, is there to establish a kind of dialogue uh, between all the actors of the field. Uh, in Scandinavia at large, even though I know that uh, you don't like that we put Denmark and Sweden and Norway in a single bag, but nevertheless, uh, in Scandinavia, what kind of bodies do you have uh, so that all the actors reach a consensus? I, I, I wouldn't say uh, there is anyone any better up there. <laughs> to, to doing that. I think we wrestle with the same issue. You have the heat pump suppliers doing their thing. You have the insulation people doing theirs. I think generally the type of work we do here is needed in the regions up there. What I think could have happened is that in some of the very cold countries, you have had a different approach to energy efficiency due to the exterior climate. So I wouldn't necessarily attribute that to that the players work uh, better together. It's, it's a different climate. It's also a different building tradition with more wood uh, in parts of this region. And, and that has led to certain effects that I, I think is part of the explanation. Well, if you don't mind, we're going to uh, move on now to the questions uh, from the public. And microphones are on their way. I would like to ask the second question. Oh, we do have someone for the first question. Please indicate to whom you are putting the question in particular or whether it's a question for everyone. Uh, Gilles Guillaume from Reuters. Question to Martin Bouygues. Could you please re-explain what you meant when you advocate 
uh, the uh, implementation of an organic approach to housing. Well, what I said is what struck me in the agro-food business is that there was a collective awareness that happened. And naturally, a lot of people went in the direction of organic food. And uh, this led to uh, a certain number of situations where uh, people moved towards a different type of distribution channel and a different type of uh, spending. Now, in housing, I believe that the same sort of approach will happen also. People are more and more aware of the fact that housing, the energy characteristics of our housing have to be improved, and uh, uh, landlords find an interest in that uh, of their own volition. They uh, refurbish uh, their uh, property uh, through uh, solar heating installations, uh, through insulation. They don't do it out of regulatory constraints. They do it because it seems to uh, both make sense from the point of view of the air and environment and possibly also uh, useful from an economic point of view. I don't think the uh, motivation is exclusively economic. I think there's a personal motivation on the part of people. They don't want, well, I think there's a real awareness in Europe and in France in particular of the impact of human activity on the environment. And people becoming aware of that uh, begin to ask themselves, what can I do at, at my own level? And there are a lot of different areas where something is possible, including housing. I fully uh, agree with this comparison, which amounts to uh, what says Ségolène uh, Royal, uh, which is rejecting a, a punitive form of uh, ecology. And uh, you're looking for the support of people, and for that, things should be presented in a favorable way. I believe in what Martin we said earlier. I believe in a plurality of uh, means of leverage. I don't think it will be the same uh, trigger for everyone, uh, for the uh, several million of people who uh, are in a situation of uh, where they have difficulty paying for their energy needs. Uh, their priority is being able to pay for their heating. And you have to uh, get them to understand that the uh, work will uh, bring the adequate response. Now, there will be, I believe, perhaps for the generation of my children, uh, the, there will be the vision that uh, we only have one world. It is a single world. And uh, with one's actions, one can weigh on the future of the planet. Now, there are uh, comfort considerations. Uh, if there's proper insulation of a home, uh, a heating system which uh, disseminates water, uh, uh, heat uh, in the whole of the house uh, is very comfortable, where uh, you are warm everywhere. And so uh, and the last criterion is uh, when you see more and more in France, uh, we have 18 million uh, individual housing units uh, which belong to families. And there's the price factor. There are less people uh, today who want to uh, buy a house which uh, consumes a lot of energy. So when the house is sold, you have to take into consideration an element related to the fact that the house consumes a lot of energy. And uh, there will be uh, families who may be uh, thinking that it's clever to take part of their savings uh, to uh, upgrade the uh, quality of their housing to maintain the value of their property. So I think that 
progressively, uh, this is something that, which is going to uh, happen throughout society. Uh, what I mean is that there is not just legal constraints. There, the market's constraints will be also uh, coming into play. My question goes to Martin Bouygues. We've heard a lot about cross-cutting, uh, collective awareness. My question is on governance. Do you uh, discuss these questions uh, with your investors? The governance of Bouygues, yes, of course we do. I'll tell you a story. With my brother, Olivier, who is present here also, it so happens that 10 years ago, we bought a vineyard totally unrelated to the big group. And we wondered, what could we do to ensure that uh, the uh, vineyard can be improved? We recruited uh, great experts who helped us uh, uh, improve the quality of the wine produced there. Wine is a wonderful product. And I said to myself, I don't know anything about wine. I like to drink it, but I don't know about wine. And I decided that I would renovate the buildings to produce a product as wonderful as that one. The production of the wine should have the lowest possible impact on the environment. So I went to Brig Construction, and I said to them, ask me to find solutions, uh, to help me to find solutions. And this is where I became aware of the fact that we were not very good at that. So I mobilized the forces of the group. We have uh, committees, and we discuss these questions. And we decided to mobilize our resources. And uh, we set the project in motion. And I'm not sorry we did that. And, uh, five years ago, I bought an, an electric car. And I said that I would be moving around in an electric car. Uh, people around me had a good laugh, but now they don't laugh anymore. Uh, that is the sort of thing which is important. You have to give an impetus. You have to set things in motion. And the fact that we uh, talk about it at Buig is important. Uh, we mobilize uh, the uh, TV channel, TF1. It's a specific activity, but we've mobilized all of the uh, people who work for uh, TF1 uh, on the fact that we want to engage in sustainable development. We did the same thing at Buig Telecom. Uh, to reduce the power consumption of uh, mobile telephone networks, which consume a lot of energy. I want the whole of our group to live with the idea that sustainable development is a movement and uh, a, a dynamic movement which uh, creates opportunities for the whole of the group. I don't want people to experience it as a disaster. We should uh, uh, experience it as uh, uh, an opportunity, something that we can live with in an intelligent way. Bonjour. Uh, good afternoon. I would like to hear your opinion. It's a general question on the role of carbon finance. How do you integrate the price of carbon in your business model? And uh, what do you ask of your banker um, when you're asking for greener money from the banker? Well, I'm the moderator here. I won't be answering the question, but I'll do a bit of advertising. This is specifically the theme for the uh, panel uh, discussion uh, organized by SHIFT tomorrow morning. So I, I'm not here to answer questions. Uh, Martin Bouygues, would you like to answer? Well, I think it's very simple. We have to uh, see with the governments how they wish to reallocate uh, part of the revenue of a carbon tax towards the financing of uh, systems related to sustainable development. I personally am in favor of that. But uh, the taxing of hydrocarbons in France is uh, fairly significant. It's been used for just about everything except for that. So we have to remain a little cautious. Are we able to reallocate part, a significant part, or all 
the ideal situation would be all of the revenue from the tax that would be generated uh, to uh, fund and contribute in the implementation of uh, subsidized loans uh, for people who would uh, be willing to invest in that area. I'm, of course, in favor of that. Uh, the question uh, pertain to your bankers and the shareholders. The, the shareholder is you. Yes, but the number one shareholder of WIG is our salaried employees. So they're very much aware of that. Do they have a way of uh, putting value on that, or is it impossible to do? Well, with the policy that we're implementing, is the group uh, in good health or not? Does the group have a future or not? I believe yes, it does, and I think we share this objective, and I share with uh, I think we th share this ideal. Jens, same question. Anything among uh, either your shareholders or uh, your bankers that lead to the fact that taking carbon into account one way or another uh, is something that they value? Yeah, so we, we don't really have debt, so the bankers. Uh, that's, that's a good start. Us, so. <laughs> um, I, I, I think on this uh, whole aspect of the CO2 tax, um, I think it can become, I think fundamentally as an idea, as a concept to not have CO2 as a free allowance. I, I think that's very interesting. Interesting. Um, what I think we get into over time, though, is that you get uh, life cycle issues and borderline issues that can complicate production for companies. And I give an example. If you produce bicycles, you do consume CO2, and, uh, but you might be replacing cars. So should they price in the CO2 or a bicycle pursuer uh, produces free uh, to produce bicycles independent of the CO2? And the same when you produce insulation, we save 100 to 150 times the CO2 that you use when you produce it. How do you put it along the chain? So I think that as this market matures, you get into these life cycle arguments that I hope doesn't divert us from the goal, which is to improve the overall picture. If you, do a pro if you introduce a problem with a metrical model, you may theoretically stop a technology that is the best you actually can do. Uh, I haven't seen any of that. It doesn't impact me. But in theory, it could happen if we go in and over-regulate in that area. Traduction de la question pour Philippe Pelletier. So, uh, for Philippe Pelletier, do you have bankers uh, in your plan bâtiment durable? The answer, of course, is yes. With uh, bankers, it doesn't make your bankers better. Uh, we have an adventure which uh, started out uh, in a wonderful way when we suggested they give out uh, zero rate, uh, zero interest loans uh, to households uh, for environmental refurbishing. And uh, the system got bogged down very quickly because it took three years for the government to um, accept the scheme. So we're going to uh, see the bankers again and uh, ask that they uh, roll out the scheme on a large scale. There are households uh, who are in an energy precarious situation who need subsidies. There are households that do not have enough savings to uh, carry out the work and who uh, would be happy with a zero uh, interest uh, loan. And there are those uh, who uh, are motivated by a tax credit a year after the investment. And the uh, cheap uh, financing resources are important also. Uh, a zero interest rate echo loan uh, could be available to uh, owners who would like to have a loan up to 30,000 euros uh, 
per household reimbursable over a 15-year period. I believe that sort of thing would be more easily acceptable. It will be easier to uh, get owners of a condo to uh, accept a project if the resources are made available at the same time. So yes, we do need bankers, and I will try and mobilize them. And um, take them in the direction of commitments. And that would be a welcome charter. Maybe you need to uh, join up with the uh, US Department of Justice to get a strong commitment. I have the microphone. Can I speak? Emmanuel Norgues from uh, Usine Nouvelle. Question to Martin Bouygues. Could you uh, tell us exactly uh, what criticism you have against uh, the rate uh, for the buying back uh, of solar energy? Well, the price has uh, gone down, and so it disrupted the system. I saw it with our uh, Challenger building headquarters. Challenger benefited from the initial rate for the buying back of solar energy, and then the rate decreased in a significant way. And so the, the choice was not necessarily uh, very relevant or not the best, possibly, to promote the development of that sector. Well, at what level would you be happy to see it? Well, you have to do a reasonable economic calculation with a return on investment, which will be reasonable for the people who will be investing in the area. It's a fairly simple financial calculation. If you want people to invest in solar energy or uh, wind power or uh, geothermal energy or whatever technology, the return on investment should be more or less acceptable. I'm talking about a reasonable return on investment. I'm uh, directing my uh, question uh, to Mr. Buig. Uh, I come from a development agency. Why are large French companies reluctant to work in Africa? I have a project for the building of a new town, a new city. May I come to see you to discuss the project? Well, we are present in Africa. Uh, I, well, we're present in particular in Cote d'Ivoire. We're not present everywhere, but we're uh, present in a certain number of African countries, and we're stakeholders uh, in a large number of projects. Africa remains a complicated continent, as you well know, and uh, it's a continent which has a number of challenges to meet, but it is a continent with a large future ahead of it. It is through projects that one is able to reduce these difficulties. That is the reason why I'm asking whether your group would be willing to help me in our project. Well, we are present in Africa today. No, I'm, I'm telling you that I specifically have a project, and will you help me? Well, you have the representatives of Bui Construction and Colas who are here, and you can explain your project to them. I'd like to tell you that we're going to take a 10% commission on any deal clinched uh, during the meeting. Emmanuel Planche. I'm surprised uh, that uh, on the topic, which was how to decarbonize the European construction sector, uh, in order to reach factor four. Um, no one mentioned research and development. Rockwell, I imagine, believes that they have the technology. Could we not uh, imagine a breakthrough in construction from R&D? 
first answer from Rockwell. Leverage of research and development. Yeah. Yeah, so research and development is ongoing, of course, and you can you can put research and development into improving lambda values, but I'm not entirely sure that that's where the payoff is to get, because it's more around how you get the system installed and how you get everything to work together. I think the bigger returns are there. Uh, you look into m modular buildings that you don't get cold bridges and such things. I think that's, that's the important thing. And then generally uh, keep uh, doing research and development in how you run uh, big corporations more energy efficiently and you, you reduce waste in the production of the material. Um, so yes, research and development is ongoing all the time. But if we look at the challenge, uh, we have between half a percent to maybe one percent new builds, and we often see these new, very fancy projects, and they might be important, but a lot of the benefit is just to put in good old tested and tried solutions in the existing building stock. And maybe then you need to innovate in the way you approach the problem, like with the vineyard, how you apply the technology, how you manage the project, how you visualize the pro project, and how you see the benefit of it and tie the pieces together. And maybe we need to do some more R&D there. I might add uh, something. Uh, I'm part of the people who are sorry that uh, when the international crisis uh, happened in 2008, uh, states uh, responded uh, as best they could, and we sort of underestimated the fact that there was a real possibility to invest collectively at the European level in the area of energy. We should have invested much more in basic research at the state level, because it, that is more the responsibility of the states. And at the same time, one could have stimulated applied research more also, which uh, is a mix of public and private uh, funding. Uh, and uh, I think w we missed an opportunity here. It's a pity. Well, I absolutely feel that although we haven't discussed it in the first part of our discussion, I completely feel that innovation is both the key to making this program successful and also it's already at work. I constantly meet with firms that reinvent what they are doing. Take an industry that is uh, that has a reputation for being traditional like concrete, but look at how much research and development they're doing. Now they can reproduce low carbon concrete. And this innovation is not just technical. It also has to do with construction modes, part of uh, prefabrication and operations in order to achieve better quality, cleaner, uh, pro projects. There's also social innovation at work. We're learning how you can approach uh, a household who owns a home in a very urban areas, suburban or rural areas, and convince them to start refurbishing their home. It's not obvious. These are techniques that we didn't have. So innovation is at work everywhere across the board, and there's probably a lot more to be done. I'm really looking forward to tax innovation. I would like to have differentiated local taxation based on the energy qualities of a building that you sell. For instance, all the various taxes that are collected when you sell a home, they could be different based on the energy performance. I'm completely sure that together we're aware that innovation is key to success. I knew that you needed to be wary of lawyers because you said that you needed uh, people to make voluntary commitments, but then you said about adding an extra layer of taxation. Well, but I agree with you. Anyway, this is uh, nearly the end of this roundtable. Another achievement will end on time, so a big thank you to our panelists.
and uh, see you tomorrow for discussion on funding and one on energy.